So I was asked to put together a little bit of a story on how do you pitch and uh, how do you decide and then how do you eventually grow with your distributor. Um, all very uh, interesting questions, uh, something that faced us when we put together um, our brand LeBlanc Cachaca, which we started really in, on Apple computers in Central Park and finally built out a company. Uh, but prior to that, uh, we ran, uh, at Moet Hennessy, we ran the French portfolio and uh, in, in the liquor business, although we did some Casa La Postale wines, but essentially we did Grand Marnier and we created a brand called Navan, which uh, I don't believe exists in the United States anymore. They pulled it. But the same things apply to, to that brand and to other brands as well, especially in the wine business where you have an atomized structure of wine, which is to say lots of competition from lots of various areas of provenance and uh, a lot of different people in pecking orders taking away profit from your uh, brand. So I think before the pitch, before you meet a distributor, you need to choose a distributor. And uh, does everybody here have a distributor now? Or who, those of you who are suppliers, do you have a distributor? How many people are thinking about what kind of distributor they need? Okay. Um, it's an important question. I think one of the things that you have to determine is really understanding who they are. What are distributors? What do they do? What do they seek to do? How do they see the world? How do they see you? And I think you should talk to as many people as you possibly can as you possibly can, this is a great setting among other settings to do that. You want to talk about the various distributors that you think might be a good fit for you. And by good fit, I mean, do they have a cultural understanding of the product and the brands that you've created or that you represent? Do they understand Portugal? In the United States, one of the mistakes we made in Cachaça, which is Brazilian, but through Portugal, obviously, is that there's no real cultural underpinning in the United States with Portugal or with Brazil. A little bit more now, but there were never wars with Portugal. There were never dates that you learned at school with Portugal. And so, not unlike Mexico, right? So you have tequila, you have a a bond with Americans. So you need to understand your distributor and understand their culture and how they go about selling the various wines and spirits in their portfolio. What are their favorite nation status, so to speak? What are they most familiar with? I think those are really important things to ask distributors and ask friends and networking people that you know about these distributors so that you can determine, is this a good fit for me? What are these people really looking to do? How many salespeople do they have? How old are they? Do they know wine? Do they know liquor? Do they know spirits? Which accounts in the areas that you're looking to, if it's New York, which accounts are they most familiar with? These are questions you should find out answers to. Um, I think it's really important to, in understanding distributors is to have empathy. Understand how they see the world, as I said, because you need to know what motivates them. In order for you to make a pitch to a distributor, you have to understand what's in his or her mind, what's working in their brain. And I, know, I understand this is an, a difficult thing to do for a lot of people because you have so many facts and figures you're juggling. I mean, the prior presentation was replete with facts and figures about things you really need to understand. I, I take that to heart because we wrestled with that to the ground many, many years. It's a vast amount of figures and facts that you're juggling. So you need to understand what's in the other guy's mind, what's in the other person's mind when they're looking at you. How do they see you? And that will help you understand at least meeting them halfway because they have a tough job. They have to move glass. That's a tough job. 
and everybody wants them to build their brand. So when you start thinking about how distributors see the world and how everybody's coming to them with the same questions, you realize that they have a lot to juggle as well. So facing them and understanding them before you get to know them or choose them is a really important thing. Um, you have to know what's on their minds. You have to know how they're thinking. Not every distributor is the same. Uh, if you go to a Southern Glaciers, or formerly known as Southern Wine and Spirits, or you go to Empire or Breakthrough Beverage now, you're talking to very big distributors who have lots of different levels and hierarchies of needs, desires, and organizational constructs that they maintain. Whereas if you go to mid-tier distributors or smaller, sometimes one or two man shop distributors, they have a quite different set of standards and needs and ways of working, what we call wow, ways of working that you may or may not fit in well with. So just because they're a distributor and you're going, oh God, now I have a distributor, I can get into the market, I wouldn't jump too soon. Do some research, figure out what's on their minds. These are some of the questions that are on their minds. When you sit down with a distributor, this is what's going through their head. It's not just about profit. It's not just about what's the consumer price you wish at shelf. It's all of these questions that I think are really important. They're trying to gauge who you are. They want to know what's behind your product. How is it made? What are the goals of the distillery? It's very important, you know, is the winery set for capacity? If I do a good job, can they deliver? Can they ship? Can they produce at the same rate that they're telling me they can right now? How does it fit into my portfolio? Is this a wine that I can easily manage within the various portfolio breaks that I, that I currently own? And what category or segment is it in? And these are the kinds of questions that are constantly going through their minds as they look at you. So you should know answers to these questions. You should understand which questions are more important for some distributors and which questions are not as important. Uh, this is about six years ago. I was talking to um, Rudy Ruiz at Southern Wine and Spirits, then Southern Wine and Spirits in Miami, and he told me that they get, just at Miami, 400 people a month with new products. This is six years ago, seven years ago. I can only assume it's much more now. So when you're going to distributors, and this is regardless of Southern Wine and Spirits is unique in the business, so they're gonna get a lot of the calls because they're very well known and they have a familiar name. Uh, and they have a huge reach into the United States, into a very antiquated distribution system in the United States, I might add. But if you go to any distributor, they will tell you that lots of people call them, knock at their door, try to meet with them. So these are questions that are not only just gateway questions for them, they need to know the answers in order to make a, an educated decision on your behalf and on their behalf. These are questions that are very important and you should know the answers to them. So in being prepared, not only should you know the answers to those questions, but you should be understanding of where you want to go. So that today, if we sat down and we went over the various distributors that you would have in mind to see, what would you tell me about your brand? Do you know the story of your brand? Are you confident in telling it? Can you convince somebody whose livelihood depends on correctly and successfully selling your product that your product is built for them? They will, they will ask those questions. So the more you're prepared with answers, the better it is. Um, I personally think that when you go and you sit down with a, a, a distributor, um, you have to declare victory. You should be victorious before you walk in that room, before you sit down. You should understand 
so much about that situation, that business, as well as your own, that you can declare victory. And so they see that from you. I think it's very important. Um, the, all the distributors I met, I would always go in with an air of confidence. They would always knock me down. They'd go, Kashasa? We can't even, they would say Kashaka. I mean, they wouldn't even know how to pronounce it. The Caipirinha was, I can't even, um, I won't even go into how they pronounced Caipirinha. Um, and they said, well, we already have two of them. You know, we have P2, uh, Pirisununga 51, we have all of them. They don't move, they're 300 cases every year for the last 20 years. What are you going to do with a Gashasa? Uh, this is the kind of skepticism that sometimes you meet up with. At least I did. So you have to declare victory. You must be confident in what it is you provide them. You have to explain to them why it's compelling. It's something about your origin, your taste, the feel, the brand. Something that says it, this is a compelling product and that it's priced right. It's competitive. I'm not looking to make tons of profit or gross profit margin on every bottle I make. I am competitively, I understand the competitive landscape in terms of pricing and here's why our brand is priced at this point. We want to be known as a luxury good or we're going to be the best at the mid-market. However it is you decide that your pricing should be constructed, that should be a compelling thought for them. And that you have assets and resources and that you're not going to leave it up to them to create the brand for you or to create just all the sales for you or the desire in the market for you, but that you will also be investing um, in people, in resources, um, and a budget. You're gonna need to talk to them about supply because too often they pick up brands and they do a good job at selling them, at least initially, and then there's no more product or the product's late or the, and it goes on and on and that frustrates them because they have salespeople who provide, you know, they provide commission to them. They go out, they do a hard job, they get your brand sold and then they can't deliver because you're out of stock. So there's a big question for them. And successful sales goals. Too many times I've seen people walk into general sales meetings uh, and declare X amount, you know, this is our sales goal for the quarter. And it's impossible to reach. Uh, when we started LeBlanc, there was what was called a quota system, which is essentially a, spe a special list of brands that the distributor was willing to put extra emphasis in sales on, on a monthly basis. And if you were lucky, you got onto that list. There were maybe five to 10 brands on that list. At Young's Market in California three years ago, there were 105 brands on that list. So if you're a salesperson, you're selling 105 brands specifically for the quota, but then you have 7,500 potential SKUs in your book. So it becomes very difficult for them. Again, empathy, understand where they're coming from. Make it easy for them. Show them how they can be successful with the product. So you have to know your brand story, in and out. And you have to work it. You have to constantly say it. You've heard the term elevator speech. You should have an elevator speech. You should have five elevator speeches that you can recite. So bore the hell out of your spouse, out of your companion, out of your sons and daughters, out of your friends. Bore the hell out of them. Keep repeating it until you believe it so thoroughly you can say it like that. Why is your brand special? What's your market? Who are your competitors? What are your costs? Now, you don't have to repeat that to everybody, but you should know them really so down that you know where the fat is in your cost. You know where you can give up and where you can't give up. Because let me tell you something, when you start hitting certain distributors in the United States, they will know where the fat is and they will try to suck that fat up as fast as possible. 
So you better know it before they do, because they know it really well, because they see at least 400 people like yourselves every month. They know you better than you know you. And once you start talking about price at shelf, and they start doing retroactive pricing constructs in front of you, they will know immediately how much it costs you for you to produce, because they know all the shipping. The presentation that we just heard, which was marvelous, they know by heart. So your pricing, how does it fit? Your distinction, why do you deserve to exist? This is a big, big question. Not enough people ask themselves. What service to, you, to the wine drinking public or the liquor drinking public um, are you providing? And who, are, who is your audience? Why they'll love you? What's the passion and the funding and the people that you have on your side? What are your strengths? Once you get to know all of these things, and each one can have a story at, attached to it, and it's up to you to pick out the stories that are the most compelling, the ones that make the most sense. Uh, then all of a sudden you have a little bit of what some people call a dog and pony show, or you have at least a little show to tell. You can introduce the idea, you can make it original and personal, you can tell a compelling story, you can make people sit up in their seats a little bit, a little bit. You make people make their bodies move a little bit. I'm looking around to see if I'm making anybody's body move. Some. So it's okay. Explain again why your brand is different. Why are you here today? And why should any other person in this room listen to you? What have you got? Even if it's tiny, that's so unique. That is critical to the way you will go into a market. Make it easy to understand. Now, we made a mistake in that. We said, we're going to call cachaça at the beginning. We're going to call this Brazilian rum. And then a Brazilian heard us say that we, as we practiced our, our stuff. And they go, no, we don't make rum. We make cachaça. So, after we had lost about $25,000 on sales materials, saying Brazilian rum, we burnt it all <laughs> and, and said, no, let's assume, let's assume who we are. We're Cachaça. And so that's what we did. So make it easy to understand and make it convincing. It's important to convince other people that you have a unique thought, that you are differentiated that you are, you have a reason to exist. Not everybody does. I'm not talking about humanity here, I'm talking about something in a bottle, a brand, a product. And what's your go-to-market strategy? What's the idea you have to get into the marketplace? How will you ring up people's minds so that they will ask for you whether it's an on-premise or an off-premise sale. Again, how do you telegraph that distinction? Even if it's tiny, do not overlook it. It may seem tiny to you, but I can tell you, you can make a world, a universe, out of tiny things. Especially in this market where there are so many competitors. In fact, you are all competitors with each other because you're looking for share of mouth. If you've ever looked at a creative brief for Coca-Cola, this goes back a few years, but it says target audience, dot, dot, everybody with a mouth. It doesn't say men and women, 25 to 30, Everybody with a mouth. So you're looking for share of mouth. You ever walk into a bar? How many people here have ever walked into a bar? Walked into a bar? Hello? It's a beverage convention. Okay. You walk into a bar, and you look behind the bar to see the bottles, right? Everybody that walks into a bar sees those bottles. Every single one of those bottles is a competitor for you. Every one, and the ones that are even unseen. So we have a competitive world that we're facing. You must convince people 
why you're different. And then you have to tell them what you need for them. Why are you there? What do you want from them? I remember one time uh, I was talking, we were having a problem with, um, in Miami with our distributor, which was part of, um, it was Premier Beverage, which became uh, part of Breakthrough now. And they were reorganizing. And so they put us with, within their organization in a place that I didn't think was favorable to us. So I called up Charlie Marinoff, who was one of the, the chairman of, 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 of this, of you know, Sunbelt, um, Trauma Sunbelt. And I said, I, I, we don't agree. Well, you know, we own one brand. What, I have hardly any sway, except he took my phone call. And he said to me something that was very true, and I've always remembered it. He said, Jerry, don't you understand? We have 380 salespeople here. That's not who you need. You need 10 to love you. You can build a business with 10 people, Jerry. And he was right. So I tell you, you can build a business with a very small percentage of people on your side because they will sell you and that will lead to other sales. This is a business of tiny differences. One bottle, one account, one client at a time. It's a bottom up business. The days are gone where you could put a lot of money into advertising from top down and hope to sell. It's a bottom up business, so your distributor is important. So you have to introduce the idea. Uh, this is the first thing we did at LeBlanc, which was just make it simple. Heart of Brazil, Kiss of France, Spirit of the World, the bottle, people, a little bit of an exotic uh, idea. And then come to LeBlanc and have a Caipirinha. We had logos that just said LeBlanc Caipirinhas. And we owned the Caipirinha because we realized to own a drink was huge. I had worked on Seagram's many years ago, and they had left one of, the, one of the great drinks of my youth was the seven and seven. And then they completely didn't advertise that anymore. Recently, Bacardi, remember Bacardi Mojito? They even had a website, BacardiMojito.com. They stopped doing that. Uh, sales went down. So own, own what you can own and make it yours. Appropriate territory. For your brand and your product, that's the most important thing. Tell your story, make it compelling, make it easy. Make it easy to see, say, and, and repeat. Uh, this was the first time we had our, our signature, which was Live Love LeBlanc in our particular colors. But it was, is, we were an escape brand. We were about dreams. We said, come to LeBlanc and have a Caipirinha. And again, make it easy to see say and repeat. Whatever you do, even your sales materials have to be compelling, but they can't be junked up with all sorts of things that are going to make people's eyes glaze over. Get your little difference and build on it. In Montenegro, which is Italy's number one Amaro, they were doing maybe 80 cases a month in the United States. After a year of doing this, they went to 500 a month. Um, the idea here was that we found out that bartenders, mixologists actually, not just any bartender, but people who were in the mixology world, um, loved Montenegro. It was their little secret sauce. And we developed what we call the B team. We took top eight bartenders in Manhattan at the time, and we formed a, a team, and they started talking about it. Uh, each one of them had five to 10,000 followers on Instagram, and they started taking pictures of themselves, giving out drinks. Sometimes what they did is they would have a person go to another bar when they were both working the same night and pay for shots of Montenegro for that bartender. And we'd film that, and we put that up on, uh, in video. Um, we built a very strong look to the campaign and had our bartenders uh, highlighted by that campaign. This, um, I don't know who's the head of TTB now. Is it John Manfreda still? But he was during this time. 
um, this was interesting. We said legalize cachaça, not marijuana, but, but cachaça. And we built a truck. This was a DHL truck that I found in a, in a lot in Detroit in the winter. And we took it and fixed it and made it look like a caipi mobile, what we called caipi mobiles, caipirinha mobiles that you would find in the beaches in Brazil or wherever. And it looked like a real truck that was giving out drinks. Of course, we couldn't, but we had lemon lime sorbet that tasted like a caipirinha, non-alcohol caipirinha, and it was very, very good and quite natural. And we went around pushing this thought, which was a, a, a mini campaign we had of legalizing cachaça. Cachaça, the word cachaça was not legal by the TTB. It was called Brazilian rum. And we refused to put that on our bottle. So uh, we had run-ins with them. And then we became part of the Brazilian Association in the United States. We own a distillery in Brazil. We pay taxes in Brazil. We're a Brazilian company, we said. But this is ridiculous. Brazil, of course, would not call bourbon bourbon. They would call it American whiskey, which irked Kentucky people to no end. So finally, after about six years of petitions, they, the government changed the uh, nomenclature, which had to do with taxes and paperwork and all the rest of it, administrative stuff, which was very th uh, red tape, um, thick with red tape, they changed it to cachaça. And in so doing, the letter that went out from John Manfredo, the president of the TTB at the time, basically cited our work, this marketing campaign, for having incited enough people to want to have cachaça, not rum because they're two different things. So you can actually create news with the kinds of things you do. Even if it's tiny, you can build it up into something special. Our packaging, uh, we said, look, we had, didn't really have the money for in-store stuff. Let's make the greatest box we can. It cost 40, 50 cents more per unit, which is considerable, but it was worth it because we could continue our look and feel and that little escape thought of coming to the blah and have a Caipirinha on the box. Um, get to know your product's pricing really well because it's going to be important. This we did for Montenegro, which you see. Keep repeating, building your brand voice. Having it distinct and memorable is important, both for uh, the the sales material, materials you use, as well as for online purposes. And social media is very important. So get something you can repeat there. Um, learn what works and what doesn't. Reapply what works and stop doing what doesn't work. So way after you declare victory, they'll be impressed. They'll say, oh, I have somebody here who's passionate, who understands every single nook and cranny of the business. I don't have to build a brand, they're going to do it. I just have to deliver glass. They'll do the rest. They'll help my salespeople. And in the end, you know what? This dog, they'll, they'll say this, this dog can hunt. I can get this done. I can do this. And you'll be happy. But then you have to start working. Grow the relationship. Understand those 10 salespeople. Take them out for breakfast. Take them out for lunch. Work with the salespeople that have an affinity for your product and your brand. Incentivize them. Build your team. Build your relationship. This is a relationship business after all. And you'll grow your market. I promise. That will, that's what will happen if you do these things. So thank you very much.